So good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a uh, meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. Today is March 23rd, 2023. The time is 5.37 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, tonight we have in attendance uh, Board of Health members, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Cynthia Suopis, Janet Grant, myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. Absent tonight is nurse Dallas Dukar. Uh, for staff tonight, we have Amy Hutchins, the Director of Environmental Services. I think we will have Elliot um, Escura, the public health nurse. Is she coming? They're supposed to. They're coming? Elliot okay. and Kelly are supposed to come and present. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, Kelly Constantine, uh, Department Assistant. Um, okay. Um, so Elliot and Kelly are not here yet. Do you want to go do the minutes? Yeah. We can go backwards. Okay. Uh, minutes were sent out. Was that today? The new minutes? Did anyone have a, there were minor changes to compared to the old minutes. Did everyone have a chance to look at those? Any comments? Comments I had were corrected in the second one. Thank you. <laughs> Amy, did you have a comment? You're muted. Okay. Saw your hand. Um, okay. Um, is there a, um, would someone like to make a motion? Move to accept the minutes. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Any other comments? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Janet? I wasn't at the meeting, but if I can say yes, I will. Okay. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. And Joanne, yes. Okay. Meetings are, um, minutes are accepted. Uh, um, I, have, I have a question for Cal and Amy. The letter that we provided to the tobacco merchants, did it have the Zoom information on it? Can someone look that up? Because Cynthia, you said the Zoom link was broken. Did you have, did anyone else have an issue getting in tonight? Well, there were two sent. You sent one and Kelly sent one. I used yours. It's, I don't know if anyone else used Kelly's. Are they the same? I used They're Kelly's. I used, I used Kelly's and got in. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I Kelly's would get you in, but even the one on the agenda through the city website was incorrect. It didn't go anywhere. So it was a broken link, but the ID was still the same. So if you hit join and put in the ID number, they're one and the same. You and couldn't, you could, or I couldn't get past join. That was a problem. So how did you eventually get in using Meredith's when link? Kelly, when Kelly, I, I made. Kelly and Meredith aware, and then Kelly sent an oh. email and said, it's broke. I think that's what she said, Kelly, but then she sent a new one yes, or another one. I couldn't get in through what was on the agenda. No, there, the letter that went out did not have a link. Oh. <clears throat> Does it seem as though we need to reschedule a hearing? But it did say there would be um, that the forum was the 23rd at 5.30. But if someone went on the city website, would they be able to get into our meeting? I believe if they were to click on or bring up Zoom and punch in the ID and the passcode, they could. Plus, there was also the phone number on the agenda to get on. So they could hear the conversation and also be able to, um, I believe, possibly speak if they were unmuted. Is that information, was that information on the letter? Uh, no. Hmm. Seems hmm. like to be correct, we would need to send that out again and reschedule the forum. Do you guys agree? I agree. Too many barriers to access. Well, and then there's some person named Ryan who's been trying to get in and hasn't been mm -hmm. able to. So that might be somebody who's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will move the forum. We'll try one more time and notify the merchants. 
with the Zoom link on it. And we'll reschedule for our next meeting, which will be April. Okay. Yeah, that's our third. And I'm just taking notes. So were you asking if the Zoom link was on the invitation for, to the forum to the mm -hmm. permit holders? I was, yeah. yeah. So we would never like um, create that until like the week of. So in order to get it out there, I'm just thinking. We can you know. create it early. It's it's always the same it. ID. It's, okay. it's my Zoom account. So it's always the same ID and password. So that's okay. easy enough to do. Okay. Um, just making notes for, to me. Actually, yeah. Mayor, the ID and passcode changes each meeting. Does it really? Yep. If you if I look back at some of the agendas, it changes each meeting. Then what I think you should do okay. is on the letter put the link to the website that has the Zoom link. The city website. We can do both. I can create the meeting early oh, and good. then we mm -hmm. can we can put that information, but we can also mm -hmm. put a link to the, the city website with the agendas. But for purposes of tonight's agenda, and since we had a revised copy, and since a copy went out, can we say, can we discuss tonight or see if they're, if everyone's okay with it? Still a draft, but can we go through that discussion if there is one? Sure, and if we decide that our draft, the draft we want to use is different, that's what we can send to the stores, I think. Sure. Um, Okay. Um, can you make Elliot co-host, please? I thought they were. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Let me see if I can share. Well, let me turn my camera on. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you. Hello. Sorry, I'm a little late. I didn't realize that the forum would be not happening. <laughs> As I'm sure all of you um, experienced. All right, give me one second. Okay, so. What if I make you host, Elliot? Would that help? Um, yeah, probably. Okay. Just don't end the meeting without hosting me back. <laughs> of course. Still nothing, huh? Oh, there we go. All okay. right. So let me share my screen. Hello, everyone. Hi. So, and this is loading still. Um, so this is a little breakdown of our, oh, sorry. Just accidentally opened a. All right, so this is a breakdown of our reportable diseases um, for 2022, and they have been. Let me zoom. They've been um, sort of standardized out of um, 100,000 residents. Um, now, part of why that is is because after this, I will show you the um, the regional levels and in order to be able to compare to the region, they kind of had to standardize it to a rate rather than number of cases, but I can go over the number of cases with you as well. I have um, the numbers going back to 2019. So Elliot, can you just give some context to what this is and where we got it? Yeah, so um, so part of our um, shared services grant um, allowed us to hire an epidemiologist and the epidemiologist um, takes all the raw data from all of our 17 towns in our grant and um, turns them into a variety of beautiful infographics, um, including this one and, uh, and the regional one. I'm just going to um, add that there's certain diseases that are a mandatory reporting. Mm -hmm. So like from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, mm -hmm. the lab actually electronically reports certain diseases. And so not all diseases are captured here. These are just mm -hmm. reportable diseases. Yes. And um, so, so overall, we're fairly similar to the region. Um, we do have higher rates of hep C. It's hard to say why that is. It's possibly better access to screening um, than overall in the region because our, our grant region includes a lot of these smaller towns like 
Chesterfield, Middlefield, um, towns that maybe people don't have the same access. Um, Lyme disease rates have gone way up. Um, and again, I, I tried to dig into whether that's true statewide and, and there's really, there's not a lot of information about any kind of jump in, in Lyme disease rates. It, I don't know what it is in terms of um, whether it's reporting or anything like that. I have noticed that a lot of the Lyme disease cases I've seen since I started were coming from small, like out of state labs. They weren't necessarily coming from large labs. I do wonder if part of it is, um, I think there's been a rise in different tests for Lyme than the standardized type. And I, I wonder if that might be part of um, sort of the signal we're getting. Where, where is the Lyme disease on the screen? Um, so, sorry, it's way at the top, 85.3. And actually, you know, let me switch over. Let's see if I can, I'm gonna, well, no, I'll, I'll stay on this. I'll switch over to where you, after this, to where you can see the raw numbers for Northampton over the last few years, um, since 2019. And you'll be able to really see the jump. Um, it went from, actually, let me just, um, in 2019, we had, um, two cases of Lyme disease, 2020, we had one, 2021, we had zero. And then 2022, we had 25. That's gotta be a reporting error because we've yeah. had much more Lyme than that. For oh, sure. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Weren't people home the previous couple of years and not out and about? They probably didn't get tested. Mm. But during the pandemic, they didn't come to get tested. Although 2019, there was only one case or two cases, so. That's, yeah, that's not right. Yeah, I, I, I think it's some kind of glitch in the in the information. I, I have a question, Elliot. Um, so if I had a bullseye mm -hmm. and I presented with symptoms that look like Lyme disease, where is that captured? Because Maven is only going to capture something if there's a lab confirmed diagnosis, correct? Would it go in a probable or or not at oh, all. I can I can look at the at the criteria for specifically line. Unfortunately, the way they classify like suspect, probable, mm -hmm. um, confirmed, it's different mm -hmm. for every disease. But I can look at that and get back to you as to like what whether that would be captured in any of this. For reportable diseases, the labs automatically report electronically. Um, but physicians are supposed to report uh, based on clinical findings, and I can assure you that almost never no one does oh okay gotcha but i don't know if it's captured in discharge data or you know problemless data or something like that but i doubt it why is why do they not report it it's not a priority yeah i think with so many other things on their plates uh things slip through the cracks and let's see, we do have a slightly higher than regional rate of TB. Um, we do have a very comparable rate to um, a town like Amherst, though. If, if you look, we kind of, the rural areas tend to have lower, the less rural areas tend to have higher, probably because a lot of these cases are in um, immigrants and we have higher immigrant populations in the more like suburban and urban areas. Uh, and, in the, and in the schools as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, group A strep has gone up. That's another one. Um, and that actually is in line with national trends. So actually, let me pull it up. In 2019, we had zero cases of group A strep. Um, and to clarify, this is only in what's called invasive group A strep. So it's group A strep in parts of the body that are supposed to be sterile. Um, so uh, we had zero cases in 2019, zero in 2020, one in 2021, and seven in 2022. Um, now I know that three of those cases from 2022, um, were found by the state lab to be genetically linked, meaning that they probably came from the same source and they were in the same facility. So, um, the state took over the investigation for that. So I'm not sure, um, what the results of the investigation were, but so, but even beyond those three cases, the cases were way higher this year. Um, and, and that's a nationwide trend. Um, and they don't know why nationwide we're seeing higher rates of, group, of uh, invasive group based strep. We've seen that before. 
I don't know how often it occurs, but I remember probably more than 10 years ago, we had um, <clears throat> uh, a rise in um, group A strep toxic shock. Um, mm. And people, some people would have bacteremia and then it just sort of went away. You know, flesh eating bacteria, they mm. called it for a while. Um, mm. And then that just went away. So mm. I don't know why. Um, and then the last type that's here is uh, GI disease, and um, and that's similar to the region, um, and similar to prior years. Um, so not many changes there. Um, we do have higher than regional rates, but again, um, we're in line with areas that have more healthcare access, so more testing most likely. How did, um, I missed the part about our influenza rates this year. Yes. So actually, let me stop sharing this and open up the other window where I have the actual rates for the last few years. We, you'll see the numbers. They're, they're pretty, um, they're pretty unmistakable. All right. So here is that spreadsheet. So down here is influenza. Mm. Wow. And we had a pretty crazy year for it. And it was very early. It was unexpectedly early. Extremely early. Yeah, almost all of those cases were, rather than being the tail end of last flu season, almost all of them were this flu season. And it's not over, right? Flu season. Right, right. This goes by calendar years. So it kind of like splits the flu oh, season. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but not unexpected that it was a big year, correct? Yeah, we we knew that. Um, yeah. we had, and um, this year's COVID levels, um, the big Omicron wave is captured in that number. So that's why. The uh, first Omicron wave, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. Good. Is it possible to get a couple more years of data prior to 2019? I feel like it's so hard using 2020 and 2021 because no one went to the doctors unless you were really sick in those years. If we could get a couple more years, Elliot, and add yeah. this to the chart. So um, we can request that from DPH. I can't run those reports. Um, there's They just don't make it very easy. Um, and um, actually, the only way I was able to get 2019 through 2021 was because Megan already had it. Um, we do have data starting in, or ending in 2016 on the end drive. So um, I, I would just have to request that uh, 2017 and 2018 information. That'd be great if we could just keep that all together and have it. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely intend to keep it all on the end drive from here mm -hmm. on. Elliot, have you heard anything from DPH about highly resistant Shigella? That's something that uh, CDC is keeping their eye on, um, but I don't know if we've had any problems locally. We have not seen it locally. They've definitely been sending out kind of information on that to keep an eye out for it. Um, I, I know that there's slightly new um, requirements around like food handlers returning to work and stuff like that in terms of testing. Anyone have questions for Elliot? I do just on that last piece, Elliot. So they, they have new requirements for if one of the food handlers have tested positive for returning to work. Yeah, so, so if someone is a food handler and they test positive for one of these infectious diseases, cert, certain of them, um, the sort of the, um, the GI type illnesses, um, they have to stay out of work until they can pr prove that they are negative. Um, and for Shigella, I think they've changed slightly the timing of those tests, because I guess they were seeing infections that were kind of incompletely being cleared out by the antibiotics. But I, I think the difference is that they made the two tests slightly farther apart. Okay. The negative tests to return to work. We can talk about that more. Like yeah, I can, and I can look up the, the details. The restaurants, you know, are aware of it, you know, so, okay, cool. Right. Anything else for Elliot on this topic? Thank you.
You have more for us though, right? I believe so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I can talk about mm -hmm. just the COVID and, and respiratory illnesses. Um, let me pull up that one. Um, well, actually, I don't even need to pull up the graphs. It's been really stable. There have been small up and downs um, in terms of COVID, but um, really we both the wastewater and the cases are showing that we've hit a plateau. We've been at the low risk level and the moderate transmission level for, um, you know, four or five weeks now, I believe. Um, and we haven't really seen any more flu cases. We have an occasional one or two, but um, not a lot. Just, um, I have a question and also that we have the press wanting to enter the meeting. Oh, uh, should I or someone else? <laughs> Not used to seeing that. <laughs> um, uh, just a question um, about um, what is it, number six vaccine or something? I just wondered if anybody has heard. I know the CDC has said something general, but any thoughts about that? Any 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 information at all on on which vaccine? Um, it, the next uh, vaccine, COVID vaccine, section since oh, the fall okay. one is a probably wane, yeah, probably waning. Yeah, so so I can say anecdotally, we are seeing a lot of people showing up at our clinics thinking they can get a second bivalent, and unfortunately, it's not yet approved, so we have to turn them away. Um, no solid news. I probably don't know a lot more than you all. Um, all indications are that they are going to um, release a new one in the fall. Um, they're also, it looks like they're moving towards doing um, a full bivalent series. Um, so even the primary doses, if people who haven't gotten any vaccines, they would start out with a bivalent rather than a monovalent. Um, in fact, Moderna monovalent right now um, is, it basically cannot be found in the world. They stopped manufacturing it and all the lots are expiring. Um, I think the last lot is like April 2nd, but we don't have any more in the region. So I know this question has come up and there's been some discussion um, quietly at the federal level about whether they would offer um, bivalent vaccines in the spring for particularly for immunocompromised patients or elderly patients and <clears throat> maybe not for everyone. Canada has done it and somewhere else in the world, I think maybe England has done it and there is talk about whether the US would do it and we haven't heard anything definitive. So I think it's being considered. And Joanne or, and Elliot, do you, have you heard anything about our local um, healthcare uh, institutions adhering to the mask on mask thing that's gonna happen on May 10th, is it? May 15th, 11th. the governor lifted? 11th. 11th, thank you, lifted the emergency. What was the we, question, Cynthia? Um, so healthcare, Healthcare facilities must wear a mask, but um, after May 11th, what's the feeling there locally? So, right, that, yeah, that was on our agenda tonight to talk oh. about what, what does it look like after May 11th? So do you just wanna pause that for a moment until we get to there? Sure, absolutely, right. sorry about that. That's okay. So um, if the mask mandate is lifted in May, I think healthcare institutions or any group can decide if they want to um, <clears throat> mandate masks in their institution. Um, I think a decision has not been made at the MGB level um, for Cooley. Um, so more to come on that, but it's being considered. I think we can just segue and just talk about this in its entirety. I mean, if you're okay, okay with that. Sure. Dr. Levin, okay. Yep. So I, I don't know if all of you know, but um, so May 11th, uh, based on current trends, the Department of Health and Human Services um, is planning for the federal public health emergency COVID-19 to end, to expire on May 11th, 2023. Maura Healy, Governor Healy has also announced that on May 11th, 2023, that the state of Massachusetts COVID public health emergency will come to an end. And um, I've talked a little bit to my colleagues and to DPH about what does this effectively mean, especially on the local level. 
And in essence, um, on the state level with this declaration, um, all public health executive orders will cease and desist. And the two that I can find, one are masks in the healthcare setting, so that no longer will be mandated. And then the other executive order, public health executive order, is the mandate that was set by Governor Baker um, to requiring a vaccine um, to work at the executive level. So that no longer, that will be lifted as well. At what executive level? For the state, you mean? For the state, for the state, mm -hmm. yeah. It was a requirement that you had to have the um, first and second in the series, vaccine series, to work in the state. The other things that are being talked about, and I'm not positive where it will end, um, we're going to see an increased cost. Right now, we get free COVID tests here on the local level and at the state. And we're able to hand those out to anybody who needs them. And um, that will see, so we won't get free at-home tests. We might see an increase of the cost of tests themselves, um, both the at-home tests, the rapid test, and the PCR tests. Um, not sure about insurance covering them. We might not get free vaccine anymore after the national stockpile is gone. So right now, at the local level, we get free vaccines and um, we are told um, what's going to happen is eventually they're going to go into single dose syringes. Right now we get vials with, depending on the type of vaccine, could be six doses in it, 10 doses in it. They're gonna be single dose syringes and they're gonna cost about $125 a dose. And we'd have to purchase those if we continue our vaccine program. Um, I, telehealth might be affected. Um, I'm not too sure what's going to happen with that because that was allowed by executive order, but doesn't really fall under public health. Um, but those are kind of the the big things that we're watching is are the masks, um, the cost of COVID testing, because again, these are all great tools that we have, right? And then vaccines. Can I ask a question? Sure. What Under what... In whose interest is it to end this, to end, you know, to lift this public health emergency so that all these things are now going to start costing money from, because that's right. all I see happening from doing that. I hear you. So I, you know, um, and I, I don't want to, um, this isn't verbatim, but President Biden has said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, um, over 270 million Americans have received the vaccine to date. Um, as a result of all the efforts, um, the public health measures and strategies that have been in place since the start of COVID, um, daily COVID cases are down by 92%. COVID deaths have declined by, I think, a little over 80%. And hospitalizations are down by 80%. So with these trends, um, comes the declaration that we're moving forward um, and we need to learn to live with, live with this as we do influenza. There just comes time, there comes a time where there is a plateau in a disease that it's just going to be endemic and we have to learn how to move forward and live with it. Not to be cynical, but the other issue is that Congress did not approve funds um, for <clears throat> ongoing <clears throat> um, supporting the cost of Paxlovid, the cost of testing kits. Um, and so there is no money for these things. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and the first thing that comes to my mind, especially Meredith, when you said 270 million have received vaccine, but my understanding is very, very few children. Isn't that correct? It never took hold. Um, Elliot could probably answer that better than I could speaking here in our area, but hmm. Elliot, are you still on? I am, yeah. Um, Do you have that data? Yeah, I know that um, that the uptake for children has lagged a lot behind, nationally has lagged a lot behind uptake, especially for older adults. Um, particularly for the youngest group of children. If I remember correctly, the rates are lowest for the youngest group of children. 
next for, I think it's like 14 to 19, that kind of adolescent age, and then slightly higher for those middle-aged children, um, like kind of the elementary school aged. Um, and locally, you know, I, I know that locally our, our rates are in general higher than the national rates. Unfortunately, this state is not giving us any data on uptake specifically of bivalent vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that when it comes to primary series, um, we definitely are looking at similar trends to the national level, although kind of all the categories are a little higher. But we're also not seeing a lot of disease in young children at this point. Is that correct as well? Uh, Go ahead, Elliot. Do you, yeah. mean, <clears throat> do you mean hospitalizations as in serious disease? No, I guess I guess I was thinking more. I mean, I'm, I I didn't have that thought through, but I, I guess um, I'm just wondering how this emerge lifting this before there's a you know significant mass of children vaccinated, if that's going to have an impact. Probably will be a barrier to vaccination because of cost. Um, I will say that the state of Massachusetts um, covers all vaccinations for children um, under 19, actually. So it goes up to age 18. Um, part of that is funded federally through the Vaccines for Children program, the, the part that covers like uninsured children. Um, but the state actually just covers all children's vaccines. So it's possible that they'll continue to buy COVID vaccine on the state level for children specifically. Um, and then my guess is they'll also probably do the same thing with COVID vaccines as they do with the adult vaccines where they'll buy small amounts for uninsured and underinsured adults, but adults with insurance, um, particularly private insurance, will have to go through their insurance for it. Do you think the state will mandate that insurance has to pay for that vaccine? I have no idea. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, those are kinds of the kinds of things that would be helpful. Right, exactly. But mm -hmm. I imagine um, the DHHS will do the, you know, we'll probably move forward as in, as what we do with the same model for influenza vaccines. We get a small amount of state vaccines for free to give to those who are uninsured and to, to the kiddos of a certain age. But then we purchase, I, you know, and it varies from year to year, um, vaccines out of our revolving fund that we started um, when I first uh, came to the health department in 2012 to be able to support a vaccine program. Now, mind you, the cost of a flu vaccine is probably $36 versus they're, they're saying right now that they're thinking it's gonna be about $125 for a COVID vaccine. That's a huge difference. I don't know how long we'd be able to support that with our revolving fund, but I think you know over the next couple of years moving forward, we have enough money in that revolving fund to continue some type of vaccination program for COVID-19. And I'm I it's not May 11th, and we're not going to receive any more free vaccines. There's enough in this national stockpile to probably get us through until maybe the end of fall, I'm thinking. Um, that's what people at DPH are telling us. But yeah, it's something to consider. Like, what is our vaccine program? Because currently we're still, Elliot, how many days a month are we holding clinics, hosting clinics? Um, we're doing one monthly clinic in the city, and then we usually have some regional requests every now and then. So I would say maybe two days a month. Yeah. A process question. What does this mean for the city executive orders that we have passed previously? So those have all been lifted? They have? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. We lifted the emergency in spring of 21 when things were looking so good before Delta arrived. Thanks, so for, for, still thanks for remembering yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just have a recommendation out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For masking. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to bring that back next meeting to discuss that because it's not consistent with the, uh, the current levels, but. <clears throat> Let's bring that back next time. Um, Elliot, did you want to talk about the childhood vaccination gap? 
Yeah. Um, so we, we have some exciting news, actually. Um, the schools had contacted us um, early in the year, I think sometime in January, that they had a, a small but growing uh, group of kids who were unable to attend school because of lack of vaccination. Um, and uh, there were a lot of barriers um, between like insurance and long, long waits for pediatricians, particularly pediatricians who will see uninsured patients. Um, and especially with NAP, um, it's Northampton office closing to uh, all new patients other than newborns. Um, it was becoming quite an issue for the schools. So um, we have now begun our vaccine program um, for children. We've got, um, we've had seven kids so far uh, referred to us by the schools. We've vaccinated two of them, um, which considering that we were only able to actually roll out this program a couple of weeks ago is um, pretty exciting. Um, so, and we've now also offered this to our region um, because through this grant, we serve uh, a, a lot of other kind of district, school districts in the area. So um, we've now rolled this out to, to them as well. Who did you get to sign your orders? Dallas actually mm -hmm. signed them. Oh, great. Great. And so this is different than what was brought up at the last meeting when we were focusing specifically on uh, pediatric immigrant patients. This well, is the same. It, this is the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, all, all but one of the children who have been referred to me um, is a recent immigrant. Um, and, you know, one of the big challenges as well is oftentimes their vaccine records are, they either don't have them or yeah. they're yeah. in another language, that kind of thing. So um, we've been doing good work with the schools to create a system for how we're, um, how we're making sure that they're getting the right things. That's great. Yeah, this program gives me goosebumps. And I'm reflecting on the phrase that you said, small but growing, Elliot, because we have eight children just in Northampton that couldn't go to school because they didn't have their childhood vaccine records or were current. Um, I usually have one a year. So that is when we compare what it looked like in years past, that's, that's a lot of kiddos not going to school because of the vaccine requirement, not being able to get the vaccine. Um, so I commend you for just keeping, you know, pushing forward and getting this done. I am so thankful. So with that, we're doing outreach with all the school nurses and the schools to let them know that we have this program. Amherst has a very similar program. So we're going to connect with Jen Brown, who you might remember, who used to be a public health nurse for the city of Northampton um, 10 years ago or so. Um, they too have a similar program and they also have a connection to resources. So we're going to set up a meeting so we can we can grow this program even further. Yeah, and, and another exciting aspect of it is that um, Hilltown Community Health Centers has been willing to pair with us to help us facilitate them establishing care there because they do have a program where uninsured um, or underinsured kids can be seen there um, oftentimes for free depending on the family's income. Um, so they we've we've got kind of a direct line to them so that we can make it easier for these families connect, to connect rather than them having to kind of go through these typical procedures that make it kind of hard for people who already face barriers. So will COVID vaccine be one of the vaccines that they'll get? The children? We already offer COVID vaccine um, to any child. So anyone who wants one can get one uh, through this. It will be included when they're getting all their vaccines to go to school. We don't know if it's going to be a requirement to go to school. I'm assuming it I don't, I don't want to assume, but we don't know if it's going to be a requirement. It, it's, it's a recommendation and not a requirement right yeah. now. Oh. Currently, I offer all these um, families uh, flu and COVID as well as the, the school required vaccines. Um, we've had one family take us up on flu and actually I was able to vaccinate the, um, the mother as well as the um, child, which was, I think was great to catch them kind of at the same time. And did they take you up on the COVID or not? I, they did not, and I believe that was because they already had at least two doses. It's a requirement in the Amherst school system, Janet. But not in ours. No. Well, thank you, Elliot. That was, uh, that's great news and great work. It's exciting. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm just going to take a pause. Um, and I know we have someone from w WLP here. Um, if you if your intention was to speak at the public forum, can you put up your hand and let me know that? Um, because when we um, started the meeting or prior to the meeting, uh, there was no one here for public forum. And we decided we would take a break and do a public forum if anyone wanted to be there. So if uh, whoever is here is interested in, in the public forum for our tobacco regulations, please raise your electronic hand. And if not, we'll just go on with our meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, shall we move to the um, draft regulations? Meredith, do you have anything else? Nope, we can move right on. Okay, so none of us got to see the latest draft because we were all looking at the older draft. <laughs> um, but in Meredith's email, I don't know if you all got to see it, um, she wrote out at what the changes were compared to our original. Is that correct? Correct. Or you want to go through them? You can go ahead. I'm bringing it up on my, uh, on my screen. Okay. So compared to what was in place prior, um, we decided, and I think we had a consensus, and then, and then in the draft, it's um, what Cheryl Sabara uh, put in, we decided um, that we would cap, uh, reduce the number of permits. So previously we had capped at 29. But Elliot, can you, Elliot, can you make me host? Sorry, I can't share a screen. Um, previously, we had 29, but the actual current number is 23, and there was one application in process. So in our regulation, we changed it to 24. Um, there is a comment in there that says if anyone gives up a um, <clears throat> gives up a permit, that our number of permits will drop. Right. So if a store goes out of business and they sell it to someone else, that's a transfer. But if actually a site actually gives up their um, permit, it would come back to the department and would not be released again. So that's that is still in our the new version, right? So reduced through attrition is in well reduced through attrition was in the version that I saw, the previous version you sent. Um, but it did also say that we'd be starting at twenty four and then reduced through attrition. And the goal um, being limiting access, I guess. Okay. Right. Is our is our yeah okay. Is the goal ultimately to get to zero? I don't think we've discussed it in that way. No, we haven't. Seems unlikely that would happen. I agree. So is there a um, regularity with which we review these? I know we tend to review them every few years, but if this is something that we should keep an eye on, um, we should probably have a set time that we're gonna review this again. So prior to the states, um regulation of June 2020, I felt like it was every year we were reviewing and amending our tobacco regulations. Um, when I look back, I feel like I have a 2018, a 2016, a 2014, and a 2012. So we'd review for six months. And by the time we executed and passed it, a new year had passed. So I feel like it was every single year. But the state finally caught up to us, right? It was all the locals doing the heavy lift and they caught up and they're like, oh, we've got 200 communities banning menthol, making the legal sales age to 21. Maybe we should just do this on the state level. And those are kind of the two, um, when we talk about public health strategies to, um, to reduce youth initiation, those are the big ones, right? 
age and menthol because kids don't want to smoke camels on filters. They, they want to, or flavor, they want to smoke something flavored like cotton candy. So this is the first time since 2019, since we signed, I think it was January, 2019, that we've, we've taken this on again. So pre the passing of 665 and post, it might look a little different. However, if I know big tobacco, like I know big tobacco, they're always 10 steps ahead of us and it's going to be a continuous game of whack-a-mole. And Sharon, Cheryl uses that phrase all the time. You know, they're always going to come out with something new and innovative and are, you know, two steps ahead of us. So I can't imagine like we're going to be done after this. Right. Well, I would say we should plan um, at a minimum to uh, review this in two years. <clears throat> I, I think our history has been something happened. We better review our regs <laughs> or a court case came or a new product came on the, on the market. So it's sort of run that average of every two years. But um, so it was reactionary, right? As opposed to let's go through the tobacco regulation again. So Right. We had Juul come out and all the flavors and and then the feds got in the picture and yeah. And now there's a new product that just hit the market as well. And I'm making sure that the language that is in our current draft regulation covers it. It is a non-menthol Newport cigarette that the pack, and I think I sent you an email on this, the packaging is identical to the Newport menthol cigarette. And we've had people who are menthol smokers smoke the non-menthol and tell us, does it have an enhancing flavor or, you know, an essence, uh, an effervescence of, um, what do they call it? I can't remember. It's in that gum, um, Arctic Blast. Um, so we're trying to make sure that you know, an effervescence of Arctic Blast, whatever that is, is covered under the definition of characterizing flavor. Yeah. And our markets have it. Our markets in Northampton have these products right now. So when we pass mm -hmm. the regs, um, we'll the language out. in this is proposed mm -hmm. that they will not be able to have it anymore. Once so we haven't, it. yeah, we have another meeting on um, the 4th, April 4th, to make sure that the language that Cheryl has proposed in this regulation will stand up to the new non-menthol Newport. So I did notice the language <clears throat> and I th and I think for those, wasn't there some claim on it that it tasted like menthol, but it claimed they didn't have menthol in it? Yes. There was something about it. So in, in Cheryl's um, wording under what a definition of flavored tobacco product, any tobacco product or component thereof that contains a constituent that has or produces a characterizing flavor. But then she goes on to say, a public statement claim or indicia made or disseminated by the manufacturer of a tobacco product or by any person authorized or permitted by the manufacturer, um, that such tobacco product has or produces a characterizing flavor shall constitute presumptive evidence that the tobacco product is a flavored tobacco product. Mm -hmm. So it's not really just about the ingredients. It's that if it looks like it says anything about it on the packaging. So mm -hmm. hopefully that will that will cover it. If you can taste something, is that not a flavor? Right. And that's exactly what it is. However, the manufacturer sheets um, clearly state it is not a flavor. So what's going to happen is um, someone in in the Commonwealth will issue a cease and desist, a violation notice. And I mean, they're ready. They're going to take it to court. Cheryl's like, when we were talking at our meeting uh, last week, she's like, which one of you want to take, you know, wants to take this on? And all of us little communities are like, we don't have the resources. But Boston's like, I'll issue the letter. Let's see what happens, you know, because it is going to go to court. She, they're they're going to have to fight it. Um, but she just wants to make sure that the language in the regulation is super clean and there are no loophole, loopholes. All right. 
All right, then section G1 and G2, update minimum pricing on cigars. So we increased the price and there was a comment on there that um, we could increase um, the price based on consumer index uh, without totally redoing the, um, this, uh, these regs. <clears throat> but it wasn't clear to me uh, it said we could reflect changes in the applicable consumer price index by amendment of this regulation. Is that amendment is isn't redoing the whole thing? It's just sort yeah. of an added addition. So we could have we could have done section G one and G two and increased that without having to go through the process of a hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Can we go back to um, the first one, the cap? So right now we have 23 permitted merchants and the renewals are January 1st of every calendar year. And we have had another potential merchant contact Donna um, looking to do business in Northampton. So we have to think about what that number looks like when we have our hearing. Because the last time that we capped, we took the number of merchants, permitted merchants that we had plus one more. So we might have 24 at the time that we have our hearing. Are you saying there's a potential 25? No, potential 23, 24. Potential 24. So if we wanted to do one more than what was permitted, then it would be 25. If we have a new merchant, doesn't that then fulfill the reason that we had one more in the regs? I mean, if, if we get a new merchant that wants a permit, then we reach the cap and we don't have any additional permits available. I thought that's what the one additional. But our cap is 29 right now. I, I understand. No, I'm talking okay. about if, if, we, if we go forward with 24 saying that, um, that it's 23 plus one, if someone comes in and takes that additional permit, then we are at the cap there. We don't have that cushion. I, I agree with you, but if he actually, if this person has the permit in hand at the time of the hearing, we will have 24 permitted merchants. I, and so, yeah. So, that, yeah. And we don't know if there's someone else looking at a business in Northampton. And that's why the board voted in 2016 right. to have that one open permit as a cushion right but we could reach the cap if yes it, it, at some point and yes. then we we don't have any, any exactly issues. exactly mm -hmm. so um what do you think do you want to do the number of permits in hand plus one or just the number of permits permits in hand we don't have to do plus one that's up to the board yep Mm -hmm. Consensus, anybody want to? How about if we decide that at, on the day of the vote? Because at that point, uh, Meredith will know if we have another vendor who's come in and gotten a permit. I mean, if that person doesn't have a permit by the time we vote on this, then, you know, we it will be that person taking the one available slot and we will have no more. I just want to kind of push back a little bit on that, Suzanne. Yep. Um, I'd like to have the draft that's going to go to the vote the following month really narrow down. So the language is I think what we should decide now, so I can have that draft ready if we're going to have a public forum again, is it going to be um, the number of permitted merchants plus one? At the, time, at the time of the vote? At the time of, exactly. Yes, at the time of the vote. Okay, all right. That's what I need to know. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Why, why wouldn't we say the number, why would we just say the people who currently have permitted licenses because we don't have it we don't have a system in the city janet that says someone has gone to um department a to get a business permit 
so they can start a business in wherever on Main Street. And then they're going to see the building department to make sure that they have a, there's no permitting system. So there could be someone who has already gone through four steps of the process to start a business and as part of their business model, sell tobacco, and we don't even know about it. So they might have invested all this money, bought a piece of property, got product, and we don't know about it yet. And then what if there's three people like that? Could happen. Not likely or Not likely. Mm -hmm. the number of vendors has been shrinking over time. Not to say that that won't that that will be true in the future, but we we have cut the number of permits every time we redo the regulation. And if there was three people that were in the process and had already invested all this this money, I mean, if the board wanted to, they could give a variance to that section of the regulation. I mean, it would have to be a very compelling case, obviously, but I think that's originally why we had that that one cushion. So how do you want to leave it that um, <clears throat> we there are our cap will be the number of permits um, cu uh, currently held plus one number of permits held at the time of the vote plus one. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Yes. And if there happen to be three people in the works, we'll we'll deal with it. <laughs> All right. Um, and the biggest change is that we took on the state's um, penalties for <clears throat> violations, so that on the first violation um it would be a thousand dollar fine um and if it was a sale to a minor it would be also be a three-day a suspension of sales um and then the the fines go up pretty steeply after that um so this is a section i think we should probably look at carefully um because i had some questions about it i can bring it up joanne sure that's section u or q q can you see scrolling down the regulation right now or is that a different screen we still have the original screen from okay. your email all right let me see if i can do this do you have to unshare and then share again i just want to mention that i had sent in a couple of questions about wording for the regulations because i wasn't able to be at the last meeting um that are i don't think they they never got addressed so i wanted to make sure i can do that too sure go ahead do you remember what they want me to do it now sure because i i didn't want to get in the middle you know yeah this next piece will be a big piece so why don't we okay do, um... so i mean the first one was just a simple wording change but i think in in the very first paragraph under statement of purpose where it said as there exists conclusive, conclusive evidence that tobacco smoking causes cancer, I wanted to propose that we delete the word smoking and add the word use in its place, since all tobacco use causes the listed health outcomes, not just smoking it. But there might be a reason that I'm not aware of to not change it. Yeah, Sounds right. reasonable to me, Meredith. Yeah, and I'm wondering if nicotine should be in there as well. That tobacco and nicotine use? Yep. Well, they don't all cause all of those outcomes. It makes it complicated. Well, right, but tobacco use causes mm -hmm. those outcomes because it, it includes smoking, but it includes, you know, right. some of the other things too, yeah. That sounds reasonable to me. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? I just um, 
when we do this kind of work without Cheryl's advice, I get a little nervous because she often tells us, well, you know, this is because of that. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think these are very, the, the, these two suggestions are very reasonable, but um, I just know she's got a, a boatload of history behind her and rationales for why she puts every word in. So I just, I just offer that. So she couldn't be here at tonight's meeting. So I know Kelly's taking notes. So we're going to take that question, both about use and nicotine. And I will email Cheryl and ask her about this. And I think she'll be at our next meeting. But if she can give us an answer prior to, we can prepare the draft. As I look at the first paragraph, I think um, there is perhaps an and missing at the end of the first line to regulate the sale of tobacco products, delivery products. And um, nicotine delivery. Is that what it is? Tobacco products and nicotine delivery products. Okay. Um, I don't see and. Right. I hear you. Okay. Or the word nicotine. Right. That's, that's I think, where it's missing, Suzanne. Good pickup. Mm-hmm. So any changes we make to this, Meredith, you'll ask Cheryl about. Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> and Janet, did you have another, another I one? I did, and, and again, I'm not sure where it is on this new, because I didn't have a chance to look at the final yep. um, draft, but I had written under D, mm -hmm. not tobacco sales to persons under 21 years old, um, where it says, I'll wait till you get to it. I'm there, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, under, yeah, two. Um, each person selling or distributing tobacco products shall for, first verify the age of every purchaser of tobacco products. I was wondering, again, just wondering if we should insert the words each time a purchase is made and then the rest of the sentence. Because what I was thinking is that if a clerk who has violated tries to say that they had verified a person's age at a prior time that they were in the store and so they didn't think they needed to do it again. What, so are you on 2A? Go um, down to 3 no. identification. Three. Okay, it's every, it's at every purchaser. Shall verify, verify the age of Every, every purchaser, but I mean, could be uh, every purchase. Oh, maybe just changing it to that. Um, should be for every purchase, I think. Shall first verify the age of, yeah, every purchase. You used to say it, yeah, the point okay. is okay, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I was leaving it well. Then the sentence doesn't read correctly. Verify the age of every purchase doesn't really work. The age of. You're talking about who's purchasing the tobacco. So it is mm -hmm. the age of purchaser. Each person. Right. So, so but I, it, but, there so should it, be an added comment that for each purchase. I right. think it, it should at, at every point of sale is what we had there in our previous regulation after purchaser. So I wonder verify the now. age of every purchaser at every point of sale. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will. A point of sale, Meredith, is not a location. A point of sale is an event. It's uh, a location. So that doesn't make sense either. So <clears throat> I, had, talking about events. I had thought that it should say each time a purchase is made. I mean, that's just one way of saying it. Mm -hmm. but... Right. Or attempted to be made. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that is D3. D3A. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that would apply to B as well. For the tobacconists. Thank you. Those are very good points. Great. Thank you. Well, no, B, I think, reads okay. Each person admitting entrance into a tobacconist shall first verify the age of every person entering. So I think that is okay. So if you have the same person at the door all the time, 
It says each person admitting entrance. So the one person who admits entrance, verify the age of every person entering, could still have the same, same idea that it's, if it's the same person that they know, it's not clear they need to do it again. <clears throat> Each time they enter is what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Each time they come. Yeah, or... I think that's. I think that applies to both. Okay. Yeah. Janet, do you have more? No, that's it. Thank you. Those are great. Thank you. Good catch. All right. Now let's go to Q. So one question I had, and we talked a little bit about it last time, was about, because these violations are so um, intense, with a first fine of $1,000, <clears> um, we wanted to be clear about uh, people who have recurrent episodes and what the start date, we, we said we were going to start fresh, but starting fresh as of when, June 2020, mm -hmm. when the state regs came out. Yeah. Right? So yes. is that... Is that written in here anywhere? Because that should be really clear. I don't think we have it in here. No, it should be right in this paragraph underneath Q violations. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also just want to point out for the group, make sure everyone's still in agreement, um, that A, B, and C, those three violations, it says um, permit shall be suspended, fines shall be issued, permit shall be suspended. And that's how we've had it before in our prior regs because we didn't want to have a lot of wiggle room or, or be biased in any way. We want to say if we agree there's a violation, that's what happens. Um, is everyone still in agreement with that? Is shell the state language used? The recommended in the model regulation is shell. Mm -hmm. Shell, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then the question I thought in letter R for the fourth violation or egregious violation, and by the way, Cheryl did put in the, the definition of egregious. Um, she still wrote shall, and I seem to remember she said she thought we should have some wiggle room there. And I thought that she recommended we use may. Anybody remember? I don't. I, I think Amy may remember because I took that off her list because I didn't understand it. Um, Let me look. I was using the checklist, so hold on to come yeah. to kind of come up with the differences. So hold and on. the reason I took it off is because it was going backwards from our current regulation. We had no. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say it's only at that fourth violation where it's really like they're we're putting them out of business. But we did um, that it <clears throat> with shall in our fourth violation. We in did our, have shall. We had mm -hmm. shall mm -hmm. in our current regulations. So, can you ask um, Cheryl what her recommendation is for that last one? Put on your list. She is going to tell you it's going. It's up to the board. Mm -hmm. Anybody thoughts? Well, Meredith made the point that that would be moving okay. backwards mm -hmm. um, if we went to May. It's been it's been shell since the last time we changed the regs, apparently. And and just in, as far as history goes, have we ever done that? Has it ever gotten to that point? No. Not since I'm on the board, but other other um, communities have had to do that. We are talking about the fourth violation. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's pretty egregious at that point. But remember, also, we have no tolling period. So if over 15 years mm. someone gets to a fourth violation, do we want to put them out of business? 
Yes. It's very, it's very simple. You don't sell menthol flavors and you don't sell to anyone under 21. And as I recall, we discussed the fact that we're not talking about signage. Here. Right. Nope. Right. Right. We're talking we, about sales. Mm -hmm. That's right. We talked about this last time. Yeah. And there's two communities right now that are increasing the minimum sales age. One's to 26, one's to 24. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because there is evidence saying that the fully developed brain now is... Suzanne, you can help me with this one. 26? <laughs> so I, I, think I actually think it's different for males <clears throat> and females, but, um, and, and <laughs> that's, that, sure. that's not a political <laughs> statement. It's not a political statement. Um, but uh, it is it is 25 to 26. Yeah. And of course there's variation. That's mm -hmm. just the average. Well, it's also wise because there are 21 year olds who are in, uh, no, no, I take it back. They're not still in high school. Um, and I would add, like, we can just go back to Jim's variety, that the one violation can be a list of violations and not including signage or anything like that, but a number of violations. So one, two, three can really mean four, eight, 12, mm -hmm. right? Mary? We didn't stack. We did not right, stack. stack. So... Mm -hmm. It's not really just one, just two, just three. It's could be that many to get to four. That occurred during one inspection. That's a, a, what I understood. Right, right. So they could have six violations in one inspection because we don't stack. And then the next violation, number two, there's another three. And then, you know, so they can have a lot of violations by the time they get to four. But the violations related to this are when they sell to, to people underage. Or sell flavors, any or of those. flavors, yeah, flavors. Well, there, I mean, there's a million rules here. There's lots of rules. And I mean, if it's about signage, they're not gonna be cited, but if it's about selling, they could be cited. Uh, I don't think that we resolved the issue of the date, the starting date, and how how to have that in the regulation. Would it would it be possible to I think back to Q? Uh, I think Sorry, Meredith I was going to ask. I want to reread egregious. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Take your time. No one should give me control of this screen ever. <laughs> Talk among yourselves. Now, um, could we start Q, the violation paragraph with, as of whatever date it was that the state made its determination, as of that date, it mm -hmm. should be the responsibility. There's, uh -huh. I, I, I know that this is being passed after that date, but I think we need to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there was a state a state action that we that that this ties back to. So yeah, that's gonna need a little more because right there it's just declaring that we can't assess the fine to a sales clerk, right? It's not the employee, it is the, the permit holder's responsibility to ensure that there are no violations because that was a huge issue. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. I just want to reword that a little bit more to be reflective. I thought that, as I read it, the first sentence does designate. It shall be the responsibility of the establishment permit holder and or his business agent and not their employee. Right. Okay, yep. Yeah. I think, um, what if, Suzanne, what if I put in a statement 
um, effective June, uh, all violations post June 1st, 2020 fall under this unified finding structure, something like that. Sure, how, however you will. Okay. I was just trying to simplify it, but it, it may not make sense to somebody reading it as to why that date is there when the date passing the regulation is three years later. And yes. it's actually a moot point because we haven't we haven't had any violations with fines since that time, have we? Two. We have? Two. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Mm -hmm. I'm remembering very well tonight. Um, okay, then that yeah, well, you know, we'll have an appendix to this and I will refer to what section of the appendix. Okay. So um, if, if we have had to since the state regulations, then we're actually not adhering to this finding structure. We can't go back. No, we did. And get, and raise it to $1,000? We, we, yes. Amy, can you confirm this? Both of them had a fine of $1,000 and a suspension period no neither suspension the suspension was up for conversation and we said no Be and i can't remember why so i can't remember why on that one mm -hmm. but both were fine it wasn't a sale to a minor jim's was not a sale to a minor right, so we didn't right. suspend but they were fined a thousand dollars and the other one was racing mart i believe mm -hmm. that was not a sale to a minor they were selling menthol yeah, now I remember that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It all blurs together after a while. Agreed. <laughs> more, more so for you. Um, okay. It, 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 what, however you would like to anchor that. So I'll draft something and I'll send it out to you in the next week or so to all the board members and you can give me some feedback. Okay. And I'll, I'll include Cheryl. And I'm not sure if this helps, but the reason why we're able to do that thousand, even though this was still in the works, is because the state was out there and that's oh. we can do the most um right, the the most serious uh so say? it's under the state violation. So there's like 10 different components of the state regulation that if you're in violation thereof, it's a first violation, therefore you have to fine for a thousand. So flavored products falls under that, Amy. Thank you. So Meredith, you'll you'll highlight those changes for us as well as for uh Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh anything else? I'm just curious what two communities are lifting the age. Um, I believe um, not. Is it Needham? I can't remember offhand. I'll get you that information. Yeah, I'd like to know. Needham, Needick. They're Eastern, nothing in the West, nothing mm -hmm. in Central. Newton? Mm, I don't think it's Newton. Okay. I'll get you that information. Great. Anything else? Anything else? Just a, I'm sorry, just, just a quick one. Do we have to review workplace? Not tonight, but do we eventually have to review workplace? Regs. One more. Cynthia, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, do we have to review our workplace regulations? Secondhand smoke, I, I forget. The other set of tobacco regulations. We can. They're solid. They hold up. Okay, cool. That's all I need to know. Mm-hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments about tobacco regs? Um, so <clears throat> what was recommended to us is that we have a forum tonight and a hearing on the day, the next time we meet, um, which be a date that we could potentially vote on these. But now we're moving the forum to next time. 
Um, so we would not vote on the day of the forum, but we would take the public comment and see if there's anything that we wanted to change. I Can so, I add something, Joanne? Yes, please. I am not, I, I'm thinking it's not the lack of information going out or the broken Zoom link for the lack of attendance tonight. So what I'd like to recommend to the board is we hold the forum. And if there's nothing really up for discussion, we move forward with the hearing that night. If there is ample amounts of um, information coming at the forum, we can open the hearing and then table the hearing until the following meeting. But I'd like to have an opportunity if no one shows up again to have the hearing in April. The hearing and a vote. Yep, right. hearing and a vote. They're linked. We'd still have to open the hearing. So it would be on the agenda. You'd have to open it. But if you had a lot of um, comment or comments come in during the forum and you really wanted to have an open discussion afterwards, we could table the hearing, have a discussion, and a vote the following month. I just don't want to prolong it mm -hmm. in case this, you know. Any other thoughts about that? Is everyone that okay sounds with like that? a good idea. It's the sa same time schedule. It's just allowing, making sure we allow a public forum to occur. Yeah. So a public forum is more of a discussion, and there can be back and forth. A hearing is more like a public comment session. Um, is more formal and limited time, and no discussion. Is that right, Meredith? Yes, absolutely. So. I don't know if it makes sense to have both on the same night because the whole point is that the public can speak and if you're having a forum that night, why would you have a hearing? Understood, but I really don't think the lack of attendance is because there was no link on the information page. So you want to be flexible in the ability to vote on it that night? Yes. That's all you're trying to do? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we'll move the hearing to our next meeting, which is April 20th at 530. And in the agenda will be the forum in case we need further. And what we'll do is I'll actually set times. So we'll have the forum from 530 to 6. No one shows up. We'll just sit and pause until 6 o'clock and then we'll open up the hearing at We'll open up the meeting at 6, open up the hearing at 6.05. I think people really need a designated time if they're going to come for public comment. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? Okay. In, in the um, information sent out about the new date for the public forum, it, you'll make it clear that the reason that this date has moved is because of technical difficulties on the original scheduled date. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, Meredith, updates? Where are we at? Joanne, can you, sh do we have a, a list of updates on the agenda? Yes, you wanted to talk about the newly hired director of community cares. Oh, yay, Kristen Rhodes. There has been, um, so I, just to kind of bring you back a little bit, um, what came out of the police commission report was there be a new department to uh, a, a department of community care to address, you know, um, racism within the city, within Northampton policing. They asked to defund the police a certain amount. Cynthia could give a lot of background his, history on this. But I'm just going to fast forward where the city did set up a department of community cares. It was um, 
a independent department with no oversight besides the mayor's office. And it was a one, one man person show at that time that really didn't even know the inner workings of a uh, municipality. So I had offered to take that department under the DHHS and support it in all of the ways that we can with, you know, our, our division of environmental health, our division of prevention. There was just so many intersects in what we already do that it just made sense for us to take this on. So um, Sean Donovan was the interim or implementation director of this department and then came and worked for the DHHS once the mayor um, by administrative order um, created the DHHS. And unfortunately, he resigned in November of 2022. So we have been without an interim director or a director for um, four plus months now. Um, we have posted the position multiple times. Um, we didn't have a large pool of candidates, unfortunately, um, but we were really looking for a certain set of skills and background in the candidate that we um, wanted to bring on to our team. And we found that person and her name is Kristen Rhodes. And she started a week ago, Monday, which I believe was March 13th. She is a great addition, not only to the DCC, but to the DHHS. She really is just kind of um, fallen into place and is beloved by the entire team. And she's only been with us for a week and a half. I feel like she's been with us for five years already. Um, she's hit the ground running. She has taken the framework which Sean Donovan has laid along with um, what uh, De Deputy Commissioner Michelle Fari and myself have continued to move forward through the last five months and hit the ground running. And she is coming to present to the Board of Health at our April meeting. So you'll be able to hear an update of the DCC. And I know Cynthia is coming to our department next week to meet Kristen personally and talk with Michelle about where we are. So we're super excited to have her. And I think you'll also be as excited as I am that she is on our team. Congratulations. Thank you. So um, that's one of many openings that we have. We still have an opening for a regional public health nurse position. We have an opening for a, uh, an administrative assistant. We have an opening for a DCC coordinator. And then we are going to have an opening for a tech person and then for another opening for four community responders at different levels. So we still have a lot of positions to fill. I can still tell you there is a national workforce crisis. Um, when I used to post for positions in 2018 and 2019, at a minimum, I'd have 100 uh, applications or resumes to review. I am lucky if I can fill a hand full of uh, applications and resumes to review. So it's it's very, very challenging. And I feel like the turnover rate is, is, is greater than it used to be in the past. We um, work, we have a, a almost, a, HR is kind of changing guard as well. Um, we have a new benefits director. We are posting for a new HR director. So hopefully with new fresh eyes coming in, we can broaden how we actually, um, write our job postings, we can broaden um, our bandwidth of where they go out. I feel like there, there's some work that can be done in that level to help elevate these, these positions and um, be more inclusive to, you know, to the people that we're looking to bring in. That's on the city level, right? On the city HR. level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are any of the positions um, entry level? Or do they all, you need experience? In our, our positions, um, yeah, so, mentioned. so the coordinator, the tech, and the nurse are not entry level. You do need to have some skill sets and um, education experience. The community responders are really, we haven't written that job description yet. I was waiting for a director to come in. It's more about lived and living experience and being able to bring the people that have that into the role and then training them on site. And we have a training curriculum that is 
anywhere from four to six months that before they hit the ground running, before we set them on the, you know, to, to so go out. With spot. those positions, I, I understand that you're saying you want the director in place first to help write the descriptions, but I'm assuming then that you, they'll still be advertised to the colleges in the area, you know, career, maybe the School of Public Health at UMass and, or, you know, somebody, maybe community health worker programs. I mean, what, wherever the people are being trained. So for the community responders, I think where we advertise will look very, very different. Um, and, and we're working on what that looks like. We work with a lot of um, different types of agencies, behavioral health, mental health, uh, nonprofits that work with people in recovery, um, that work with people that that have lived and living experience. So we will make sure that we tap into those resources. So the job descriptions get to the people that we are trying to attract for the position. Um, but we do everything that we can when there is an open position. Um, I work with HR to make sure that it's there is a broad cast, you know, broad net casted. Then I have all of my staff reach out to their affiliations, to their um, personal and, you know, <laughs> um, career networks. And then, you know, recently we just went to the UMass um, Career Health Fair to recruit mm -hmm. there. Like we are really reaching far and wide to bring people in. And um, just because there is or there are these set minimum requirements, if there is a person that really kind of checks many other boxes but doesn't meet that, then I go to back. I go back to HR to see if we can make accommodations to recruit them. It's a, it's different. It hiring looks very different today than it did four years ago. And where did you get the? Uh, you said you have a, a training uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. Did you get that from another community? Um, so no, so, um, Sean um, was very good. That was kind of one of um, his specialties. Um, mm -hmm. Sean Donovan, uh, he did a lot of training and professional development. So he wrote the curriculum and we hired a few consultants that have already that already have these types of programs running and have taken their best practices and incorporated them, them into what we think best fits our community. And then we've also been working with Earl Miller over in Amherst who has trained their community responders and Sean went to their trainings and again, kind of brought back that information to, to us to, to kind of flush out what is going to be the best for our program. Cause our program is a little different than all of the other national programs and Amherst programs. We are a freestanding public health, public safety model where there is not one in, in the nation. And who would do the training? So we have contracted with uh, a couple national contractors to come in. Um, we have some local experts right here in the DHHS. So we are tapping into uh, all different types of, of people from diverse backgrounds. We right now are in the process of training all of our municipal employees. Uh, it's a DEI training, diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, uh, interrupting racism. I brought this to the mayor as part of the DCC. We want to make sure that the people who are working in the municipality have some foundation in um, racial issues. So um, the mayor approved of this, so we're bringing this to all municipal employees. Her goal is out of the 430 employees, by the end of this fiscal year, which is June 30th, at least half of them have the foundational training, which is interrupting racism one and two completed, and then we'll do the second half of the employees the next fiscal year. Great. We're not claiming to be any type of expert in any type of, you know, racial, social justice, but um, I feel like my prevention team really has just 
uh, an eclectic background that when they come together, they can they can talk the talk, they can walk the walk. And then we have these experts all around us right here in the Valley that we can bring really innovation to the city of Northampton. We can bring, there's just so much that we can do. And I feel like as we are now the DHHS, it's our charge to do so. Great. Any questions, comments? Very impressive org chart. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it says draft because it's ever evolving. <laughs> it's still yeah. impressive. The, the org chart and the narrative are just amazing. And um, Meredith, you know, the, the intersections of health and um, DEI initiatives are just everywhere top of mind, no matter where you go in healthcare. So I'm so happy that that we're a part of it. <laughs> so um, keep up the good work. I'm so uh, I'm anxious to meet Kristen and, and Michelle and, and see what the vision is, because I know it's a good one. So thank you. We'll also I'll be introducing um, Kristen at the meeting on April 4th, and it's a subcommittee of the City Council, and I think it's called is city service meeting, I believe it's called. So if you'd like to attend and Kristen is going to be prepared to be able to give an update on the DCC at that meeting. And Cynthia, thank you. And it's definitely a team. I, I couldn't do it without my division directors, without their, their team. I mean, we are, we're small, but we're mighty. You've got a lot of talented really? people on your team now. A lot of talented people. My <laughs> father told me when I was very young, um, hire people who are smarter than you. <laughs> 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 and I live by that mantra. <laughs> cool. All right, any other questions or comments? I think that covers our agenda. Anything else? All right, so our next meeting is April 20th. We'll have start with a forum on the uh, 530. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Move we'll to adjourn. Oops, I'll second it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any discussion, comments before we go? Great. Right. All in favor? Janet? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. And I'll say yes. Thank you, everyone.